At Porto do Acu in July 2025, a crane operator sprinted for his life at the 13-second mark, before any alarm sounded, before millions in machinery crashed into the harbor. Viral footage proved his instinct outpaced the technology trusted to save him. How did a fail-safe system fail so catastrophically? And who will answer for an eight-figure disaster that started with a feeling no sensor caught? The answer begins where raw instinct met the weight of 750 ton. Inside the cab, the world narrowed to the hum of hydraulics and the low vibration beneath the seat. The operator's hands were steady on the levers, eyes flicking between the load and the readouts. But something felt off, a sensation that did not match the smooth numbers glowing green on the panel. It was a shift, subtle at first, more felt than seen. Years of experience had tuned his senses to the smallest cues, the way a crawler track might press deeper, the faintest tilt, a change in pressure through the floor. It was not the alarms or the sensors that caught it. It was the body's own warning system, the inner ear, and the deep muscle memory from a thousand lifts. At exactly 13 seconds into the lift, before any mechanical warning sounded, he moved. Not a jump, but a decision, a practiced urgent sprint that took him around the cab perimeter toward the front, away from the rising mass of counterweights. The vestibular system, buried deep in the skull, can sense acceleration and tilt in fractions of a second. For crane operators, that sense becomes a sixth sense, a silent partner in every risky move. He did not stop to check the screens or wait for a siren. The shift in balance, the way the cab seemed to float for a moment, was enough. Instinct took over. The door swung open, steel groaned somewhere below, and adrenaline erased the distance between seat and escape. Later, investigators would pore over alarm logs and telemetry, searching for the first sign of trouble. But in that moment, the only evidence that mattered was the feeling in his gut the certainty that something massive had changed, and the window to act was already closing. Alarm system logs from the Manitowoc M18000 reveal a precise timeline. At 13 seconds, the operator's movement registers on the cab's internal motion sensor, the door handle engaged, and the cab door swinging open. The crane's load moment indicator, the instrument responsible for detecting overload or instability, remains silent. Telemetry records show a 0.7 second gap between the operator's first action and the initial alarm. Only after his sprint toward the front does the system trigger its audible warning, a brief, high-pitched tone followed by a flashing red light on the main panel. This delay is not a software glitch or a fault in the electronics. The sensors are calibrated to detect measurable changes hydraulic pressure spikes, angular deviation, and track displacement, events that lag behind the first almost imperceptible shift. The operator's body, tuned by years of exposure to subtle cues, responds before the numbers cross the threshold. The vestibular system, the inner mechanism responsible for balance and spatial orientation, reacts within fractions of a second to the crane's tilt, long before the microprocessors can process the data and issue a warning. For investigators, the log files tell a clear story. The operator's reaction time measured against the alarm system's activation leaves no ambiguity. His decision to run was not triggered by a siren or a flashing light, but by a physical sensation, a shift in weight and a faint lurch in the cab's posture. That 0.7 second window between movement and alarm is small, but in the context of a catastrophic collapse, it is everything. Automation is designed to protect, but in this case, the human system detected danger first. The forensic timeline, reconstructed from digital traces and physical evidence, draws a sharp line between instinct and instrumentation. The Manitowoc M18000 stands among the giants of modern heavy lifting. 
Designed for the world's most demanding jobs, this crawler crane carries a maximum rated capacity of 750 tons, enough to move the kind of offshore equipment that keeps oil fields alive. Its main boom can reach over 300 feet, and with the right configuration, even more. The machine's counterweight system, a signature feature, balances up to 295 metric tons of steel slabs and modules. These counterweights are not just ballast, they are engineered to shift mass at precise moments, fine-tuning the center of gravity as the load swings out over water or key. The M18000's dual crawler tracks spread the immense weight across a footprint wider than most city buses are long. Each track section is built to handle concentrated loads, distributing pressure as evenly as possible to reduce the risk of ground failure. Onboard diagnostics monitor every critical system, hydraulic pressures, track alignment, boom angle, and counterweight position. Redundant sensors feed data into the load moment indicator, which continuously checks for overload or instability. During the Porto do Aku lift, all diagnostics reported nominal, no faults, no warnings. The machine itself showed no sign of distress. This is a crane built for reliability. Manitowoc's engineering standards require each major component, boom, car body, track frames, to pass rigorous stress testing before leaving the factory. In the field, maintenance logs record every inspection, every replaced pin, every torque check. At Porto do Aku, the M18000 had cleared its pre-lift checklist. Hydraulic fluid levels were within range. Counterweight modules were confirmed locked. The operator's console displayed a full set of green indicators. No alarms, no anomalies. For a lift of this scale, the machine is only one part of the equation. The payload, a multi-million dollar umbilical reel, waited on the key, ready for transfer to a deep water vessel. Yet as the records show, the crane's systems performed exactly as designed. The problem would come from beneath, not from within. The umbilical reel at the heart of the operation was more than just another piece of cargo. Designed for deep water oil extraction, carried miles of armored cable, each meter engineered to withstand crushing pressure, salt water corrosion, and the relentless movement of the Atlantic. The reel itself weighed in at over 200 tons, a figure that stayed well within the Manitowoc M18000's rated capacity. On paper, the margin between the crane's limit and the load was clear. In practice, every ton mattered. Umbilical reels like this do not just represent technical achievement, they are linchpins in multi-million dollar offshore projects. Failure to deliver on time can stall entire drilling campaigns, costing operators hundreds of thousands of dollars per day in idle vessel fees. The reel at Porto do Aku was custom fabricated for a specific wellhead, its dimensions and weight certified down to the last kilogram. Insurance papers listed its value between three and five million dollars, but for the project's timeline, its worth was higher still. As the crane's boom eased the reel upward, the load's compact shape and high center of gravity became critical. Unlike a spread out container or a low slung module, the reel concentrated its mass along a narrow axis. This focus meant the forces transferred through the rigging and down to the crawler tracks were sharper, more intense. The load charts showed a comfortable margin, but the real test would come from the ground beneath. In the seconds before the collapse, the combination of the crane's own mass and the suspended reel pushed the quay's bearing pressure toward its limits. The load's role in the disaster was not that it exceeded capacity, but that it acted as a pivot. When the ground gave way, the reel's weight pulled the boom forward, setting off a chain reaction that neither machine nor operator could reverse. The umbilical reel, engineered for the deep sea, became the anchor that dragged the crane into the water. It is a stark reminder that in heavy lifting, the value and physics of the payload are inseparable from the risks below.
Indentations appeared along the quay in the final seconds before collapse. Shallow at first, they deepened with startling speed. The crawler tracks, engineered to distribute hundreds of tons, pressed into the asphalt as if it were soft clay. Surveillance footage later allowed forensic engineers to measure the depth of these tracks frame by frame, revealing a rapid progression. Less than two centimeters of depression at 10 seconds, then nearly six centimeters by 13 seconds. The surface, designed for heavy rolling loads, showed clear evidence of distress under the concentrated point pressure from the crane's massive weight and the suspended umbilical reel. Indentations marked the failure. Using digital photogrammetry, investigators mapped the pattern and depth of the indentations. The tracks left a clear signature, parallel grooves with edges crisp at first, then smeared as the ground yielded. This was not a uniform settlement. The deepest imprint aligned with the crane's leading track, directly beneath the suspended load. Asphalt reinforced with aggregate is meant to resist deformation, but the underlying soil had begun to shear. Engineers cross-referenced these measurements with the crane's known footprint and calculated the applied pressure at the moment of failure. The result was a localized bearing stress that exceeded the key's rated capacity by more than twice. No cracks or surface spalling were visible before the event. The warning came as displacement, silent but measurable when the footage was slowed. In normal operation, a crawler's tracks leave only faint marks on a well-constructed port surface. Here, the tracks cut deeper with each passing second, a visible record of the ground's inability to carry the imposed load. Investigators used laser scanning on the damaged section to confirm the video analysis. The resulting three-dimensional model captured the final geometry, a shallow basin deepest at the point where the boom's arc began to tilt. These surface clues told a story that sensors could not. The ground, not the crane, was the first to show clear signs of overload. The evidence was written in the asphalt, indentations that deepened with every heartbeat, announcing the failure before steel or alarms could respond. Ground failure came first. Pressure is measured in numbers, but collapse happens in motion. At Porto do Acu, calculations after the fact revealed a stark truth. The combined mass of the Manitowoc M18000 and its suspended load pressed down with more than three times the allowable bearing pressure of the key. Engineers pieced together the overload from track width, boom angle, and the measured area of contact. Each crawler track, nearly two meters wide, was meant to spread the force. But with the umbilical reel lifted high, the pressure concentrated beneath the leading edge. The ground, already compromised, gave way in a matter of seconds. This was not a slow sink, but a mechanical cascade. As the surface yielded, the crane's center of gravity migrated forward, crossing the invisible tipping line. The boom, extending over the water, became a lever. At the critical angle, the suspended reel acted as a counterweight, no longer held in balance. The shift was sudden. The leading crawler track dropped into a depression, tilting the superstructure. The counterweights, instead of stabilizing, swung upward as the rear lost support. Gravity took command, pulling the entire machine forward. Frame-by-frame -frame analysis shows the angular progression, a two-degree tilt at 12 seconds, five degrees at 13 seconds, and then a rapid acceleration toward the water. The boom, stretching over 300 feet, struck the edge of the key and then the hull of the waiting supply vessel. Steel groaned, rigging snapped, and the umbilical reel, worth millions, plunged into the harbor. The collapse unfolded in less than four seconds, from the first visible ground failure to total loss of balance. The sequence is clear, stark, and unforgiving. In heavy lifting, protocols dictate safety margins and ground checks. But in this case, the numbers on paper could not stop the physical reality of overload. The chain reaction was irreversible once the ground capacity failed. 
the aftermath left not just a ruined crane, but a new set of questions about how load, surface, and motion interact when the limits are crossed. Safety protocols for heavy lifts at ports rely on more than just equipment checks. They demand rigorous scrutiny of the ground itself. Before any operation, standard procedure calls for a matting plan, engineered platforms or layers designed to spread the crane's weight and prevent concentrated stress. Each mat is rated for a specific pressure, measured in kilopascals, and must match or exceed the demands of the lift. At Porto do Acu, documentation later revealed a missing link in this chain. While the Manitowoc M18000's load charts and maintenance records were in order, there was no confirmed verification that the mats in use met the required bearing capacity for the key's surface. The ground's actual load tolerance should have been validated through recent soil testing, yet no such report was attached to the lift permit. In the aftermath, investigators compared the mat ratings to the calculated point loads from the crane and its cargo. The numbers did not align. The key's surface, already stressed, was left vulnerable to overload. This procedural gap shifted the focus from machine failure to planning oversight, raising questions about whether the collapse could have been prevented with stricter adherence to ground preparation standards. The financial toll from the collapse stretched far beyond the immediate wreckage. The Manitowoc M18000 itself carried an insured value estimated between $8 million and $12 million, a figure that does not account for the specialized modifications Maya made for offshore lifts. The umbilical reel, now lying at the bottom of the harbor, added another multi-million dollar loss. Its replacement and delivery delays threatened to stall deep water operations for weeks. But the true cost rippled outward. Port authorities faced a shutdown of the affected key, with downtime estimates ranging from several days to several months, depending on salvage complexity and structural repairs. Early assessments placed the total impact between $30 million and $50 million, factoring in salvage operations, lost contracts, and penalties for missed project milestones. Industry forums lit up in the aftermath. On Crane Hub, one comment quickly gained traction. The crane is not to blame here. It was the platform. That sentiment echoed across professional circles. Operators, engineers, and insurers all pointed to the ground preparation, not the machine or its crew, as the weak link. For many, the lesson was clear. In heavy lifting, the cost of a single oversight can cascade through entire supply chains. Today, ports worldwide still trust concrete and calculation to hold impossible weight. But as megaprojects grow, Ground failures remain the hidden threat. One misjudged surface can topple millions in seconds. Every crane stands on more than steel. It stands on trust in what lies beneath. Progress depends on remembering how quickly foundations can give way. What do you think, fluke, or a warning we are still ignoring? Share your thoughts below.